just interested um, to try to understand a little bit more about how the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, and how the tribal governments have set up through that system, um, you know, how, how that influences, or in your view, how that influences sovereignty, um, how the U.S. handles it, but also, you know, specifically from the Native nations as well. Okay, um, I'll take a stab at it, and then my colleagues might want to jump in. Um, I'd like to remind you that there is a case called the Cobell case against the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of Interior, um, which is responsible for the BIA. The BIA has um, lost 40, mil 40 billion I believe it's 40 billion dollars of um, Native nations and Native individuals' monies. Um, they can't find it. It's not in a drawer, it's not under a car. <laughs> but 40 billion is missing. You know, I, I, I wonder um, if this happened to another community, I think all hell would break loose. But anyway, the Bureau of I say that because it just gives you an idea of the incompetence of that Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, I believe their website was shut down, um, and they were also found in contempt of the Federal District Court. Uh, so the beginnings of this procedure legally uh, are not going very well for the U.S. and the Department of Interior. However, as my colleagues had mentioned earlier, um, what the Bureau of Indian Affairs looks at is a trust responsibility, um, a status of a ward, um, which Scott also mentioned, um, and all of those, those legal and social stigmatisms uh, that come out of that out of that department. Um, that the Bureau of Indian Affairs is responsible for meeting the responsibility of something called health, education, and the welfare of our people in exchange for our land. That was the promise when it came to treaties. And, and as Scott said, treaties are the supreme law of the land and they're all also only done between sovereign nations. Right? Individual parties can't be a party to a treaty. I mean, it's an interesting fact, I think, too, to recognize that the, uh, what we now call the BIA, used to call the Indian Bureau, is located in the Department of War. Mm -hmm. And then it moved to the Department of the Interior. And it's charged with maintaining this trust responsibility. But there are many cases against it. Um, and as I, I'm not a lawyer, I don't even play one on TV. Uh, but as I understand it, uh, frequently these cases are go right into that uh, idea of the trust being violated in some way. To give you another example, there's another case right now in Minnesota um, where, uh, to make this long story short, uh, in the 1860s during the Dakota Wars, there were a group of 200 Dakota who um, agreed not to fight in the war. Now this was basically a group of old people and women because the men had already been killed, basically. But uh, they signed uh, a treaty with the United States saying that they would not um, enter into hostilities and that they were just gonna stay out of it. And in exchange, uh, there was uh, some land that was uh, reserved uh, for them, and they were called, uh, at the time, loyalists. It's not really true that they were being loyal so much as uh, you might, I don't know, I think it would be better to call them survivalists. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what happened after the war was basically the land was um, given to other Indians. It was uh, prisoners and people that were around in other Dakota, and groups were, new groups were created, and the, dis the loyalists, uh, so-called, never got that land. Uh, my grandmother is actually Dakota. She's uh, Middlewalk in Dakota from um, southern Minnesota. And her mother, my great-grandmother, used to, she, her mother was one of the signatories. And uh, she used to talk about um, uh, this land that was coming. This is like, you know, when I was a baby, 1868 or so. 
And uh, it was something that you wait for a whole life and nothing ever happened. Um, well, what happened was these lands that were um, mismanaged by the BIA uh, eventually ended up in the hands of other natives who um, built uh, institutions and created uh, new governmental ins institutes and uh, uh, now have a casino called Mystic Lake. And they're incredibly wealthy, so it's the shock of human that's that's on this land. Um, so there is a case of the descendants of the original 200 people that were supposed to get the land, um, but who never received it, who ended up in Minneapolis, and where both, most, of them, most of them, like my grandmother, uh, were very poor. Uh, there's a large native uh, urban community, uh, uh, population in the, in the urban community, and that's where most of the Medawakitans ended up. And so today there are descendants who are all part of this uh, uh, this uh, suit, and that case I know is talking about the trust responsibility being violated because the United States was supposed to take care of that agreement, and they didn't. They they um, messed it up and then tried to cover it up, and then we get into details, so I won't go on too long about that. But this this idea of trust responsibility, as I understand, is is always um, not always, but very frequently at the core of complaints against the BIA. I'll make a one short statement in relation to looking at the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the trust responsibility, and, and it relates to the uh, issue. Now, here you have a government agency uh, in the Department of Interior who's supposed to take care and represent the tribes in relation to this trust responsibility and the other party is the United States government. So there really is a conflict of interest here in relation to, you know, looking at the Bureau and, and uh, looking at all of the trust responsibility and self-determination uh, when you have an agency which is part of the government. Perhaps the best chance in the last 15 years to get the United States to ratify the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child I was wondering, for those who haven't followed this, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, I believe, not only guarantee some economic human rights to children all over the world, um, some self-determination for children and their right to culture, but also uh, it would radically uh, change how uh, nations do things like uh, capital punishment for kids under 18. Um, the U.S. happens to be one of the two nations that has not ratified the convention, as far as I know. So I wonder to what extent would possible U.S. ratification of this convention, which has a good chance to have an Congress potentially, what could that do to help leverage support for the Declaration of Indigenous Rights and, and other expressions of tribal sovereignty? Certainly, any support of any document of any kind that protects human rights not only of children but of indigenous peoples would certainly be a positive move. Move maybe with that convention, we can dovetail on that work so that Congress begins to hear about this declaration. The thing is, is that the declaration is not talked about or discussed. Um, domestically in this country. Um, I'm sure most, I shouldn't say with this crowd, but many folks in the U.S. do not know that, that we're on the second decade of the world's indigenous peoples, that there was an international year of the world's indigenous peoples, that there are working groups, that there are permanent forums, that we are the only peoples within the UN who have that kind of forum. And I don't think most Americans know that, nor do they know that the US um, and Somalia uh, are so strongly connected when it comes to the rights of the child. And my understanding was with the US, the problem was conscription, um, Capital punishment. And, and potentially spanking children. I think Jesse Thomas' big problem was that he was afraid he wouldn't be able to spank the children. Oh, spank the children, I see. So, corporal punishment. Yes, yes. Um, but 
the, the convention on the rights of the child is not something new. It's been around for a while, trying to gain momentum, just like the Declaration. Um, it, it just is unconscionable, unconscionable to me that the Declaration is not being passed after 500 years. I mean, indigenous people shouldn't have to wait another day, let alone 500 years, to have our human rights and our right to self-determination, just like everybody, all other human beings, protected. It's unconscionable.